Enhancement Software Organization to share with others our experiences. Last mile, last mile to continuous integration. What a challenge and an awesome reward it has been for us to get there. Uh, many have asked us throughout the company, specifically, what did production enhancement do to achieve what we perceive to be a very lofty goal? It is my hope that by the end of this webinar, we provide you with insight on the milestones that we have taken and achieved to get there. Now, I do know that probably on this webinar, uh, some joining a call today may be developers, testers, software configuration managers, or even technology leaders. But we do all have one common goal, and I do believe that is that we face the same challenges of delivering new capabilities to our customers at a rapid pace while maintaining the quality of the product. So over the next hour, we hope that we can spend time discussing with you the steps the software testing team took specifically in achieving this milestone. So with that said, let's move on to the webinar. So. Some of you may be asking us joining the call, who is production enhancement and how does the software testing team play a role in that? Halliburton's production enhancement software team, we provide actually technology to our field engineers with the use of large enterprise software products to optimize oil and gas reservoir production through a variety of services and processes known as hydraulic fracturing and oxidizing. So as we progress, through the next slides, we will discuss more around our background and how the software organization has contributed to that. As I'm sure some of you may be wondering about the size or even the makeup of our team and what it actually takes to deliver its products and features. A little bit about the background of our organization. In order for our team to achieve this delivery, on such large-scale products, it encompasses very large teams using an agile model. The delivery to our customers around features is very important, but the quality regarding this delivery is equally important. Halliburton Production Enhancement field engineers are running service jobs in the field for our customers, and as a company, we cannot afford for them to experience downtime. This downtime includes performance degradation, bugs, or even missing feature functionality that previously existed. Our products are delivered within an end-tier architecture, and thus it requires several integration points and skilled team members to, de to develop and test the products. As you can see from the graphical representation on the right, there are several layers in delivering our products, and included in those layers is a sophisticated gaming user interface complex math model that allows us to view data in a 3D viewer, archival and retrieval of large data, millions lines of source code. In addition to that, as you can see from the graphical representation above, the product includes many tiers, communication layers as well. Regression testing to ensure that all requirements have been satisfied from system integration regression testing, performance testing, user interface validation testing, data validation testing, and feature functionality along with backwards compatibility, licensing, security are all in place and requires a high level of test coverage. This coverage deemed very long and extensive manual test execution. If we were ever to meet the requirements being placed upon us to increase the pace of delivery, as previously discussed, while maintaining the quality, we would have to do something different. As we deep dive into the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the challenges we face and what we've identified as being required to make a difference in getting there. It is a no-brainer that many organizations suffer with similar challenges of having their testing team match or even slightly maintain the velocity of the development team. So as we discussed, increasing the velocity of the testing team 
We also knew that for us, getting the delivery to our customers faster was our ultimate goal. For an enterprise product this large, our team was constantly struggling with being delayed between development being code complete and what we actually define as being done. Thus, doing something different was required. So before I talk a little bit about this actual graphical representation that you see on the screen, I'm not really sure if those of you on the call are familiar with Martin Fowler. But if not, I want to talk a little bit about Martin Fowler, who's a British software engineer, an author, an international speaker on software development. He's also helped to create the actual manifesto for agile software development in 2001, along with other co-authors. And in his definition, he states that there are several definitions for continuous delivery and deployment. However, I want to bring more to the definition that he talks about, which is based on the idea that software is created to fill a business need and that it must be delivered more frequently and reliably so that customers, whether they, whether they are internal, so for those of you on the call de developing software internally, or those that are on the call developing software for external use, can start seeing their benefits. For a company that ships software or that depends on software to deliver its products or services faster, delivery of working software is critical to becoming or staying competitive. As you see from the graphical representation, in our organization, we are actually working in an agile model. And in that model, starting on the left in the green, we are actually pulling products, features from our backlog. And then the product teams, or uh, scrum teams, are actually working to implement those features within shorter time periods, for us known as sprints. And then in the blue, we're able to deploy them faster to users through operations where we stage the deployment. Finally, some of us are then able through to then monitor this delivery to our customers through what's known as a validation phase that allows our customers to validate the software, provide us immediately, immediate feedback, and that feedback is then an input again into the product backlog. During this process, our software development team is constantly integ integrating the product by building it, deploy deliver deploying it, and delivering it to its to our customers. Next slide. So for continuous integration, some may ask, what are some of the approaches that your organization or our organization specifically are taking? And for us, the way that we've achieved this is through maintaining feature branches. And I know that some of you on the call are saying that probably from your research or even experience, feature branches are not always ideal when doing agile. However, I must caution you that there are times when this may need to be the case. For our organization in particular, where you have very large enterprise products that are tightly coupled, some product features may not be necessary for the business to see early on. Those features may also have not gone through their full cycle. However, you may want to allow your development team to start working on those features early. And so you may choose to branch. In addition to having feature branches, you may be working on infrastructure or architecture that may require you to branch off while allowing you to maintain what's known here in the yellow dots as your master branch. This then allows your project teams to continue to work within their sprints or iteration cycles, which for us are two-week sprints, while maintaining the quality of what we call our trunk or our master branch. Through this process, you will see from the lines here that we're continuously building, integrating, and deploying by dropping in or merging down the code from both branches, whether feature branches or UI branches, into our master branch, thus allowing us to continuously be potentially shippable to our customers from this master branch. This allows us to always maintain the quality of this branch, reduce the rework required, and move quickly on to the next feature that we pull from the product backlog. Next slide. So 
I'm sure that I probably sound as though this all went great for us, but we did have challenges. There were challenges at the beginning of doing this that were identified as to why we even took on this endeavor. And there were also challenges while we were working on this effort. So I first want to talk about the challenges of why we even took on this effort to begin with from a testing perspective. So as I stated before, um, many organizations, and I'm sure if you're testers on the call or maybe developers, you're probably experiencing some of the same challenges that we had experienced, which is that your testing team may be falling short with being able to keep up with the same pace or velocity that your development team is keeping up with. In addition to that, your resource constraints that may be placed on you within your organization. So although you may have a large test bed to do regression testing, you may not have enough resources to accomplish that, which then extends your regression testing cycle. So for us, when I originally took on this challenge, um, we had an eight-week regression testing cycle. Now we also had low reliability of our tests and low scalability of our tests. And we'll talk more about the reliability and the scalability of our tests, which is more so around our test design. But we also found, as I stated, that our testing teams were falling behind in sprints. And so we were constantly being challenged with being able to make quality trade-offs and in order to meet the expectations around the date. And then when we would do that, we also faced the challenge of not meeting the customer's expectations either because we didn't deliver the features that they were expecting or the high quality features that they were expecting or we were delivering the feature functionality but we were making quality trade-offs. So we knew that in order for us to achieve reducing the cycle time of testing while maintaining the quality trade-offs, automation was essential but it was not the complete solution for us. So as we progress to the next slide, we'll talk more about that. So for some of you, I'm sure on the call, you may not actually have the same platforms or infrastructure that we've had, but I want to spend some time highlighting the Production Enhancement Software Teams platform and some of the issues that we face. First of all, if you're on the software testing team, I'm sure you can relate to the challenges that you may already face with sometimes having the mystique of being seen as different or divided from your development organization. And when you bring in a platform or a tool that's on a different platform than that for the development team, it exasperates that. Also, when your automation team is on a different tool than the manual testing team, that creates an additional divide. So it makes it very hard for the team to be able to collaborate or have visibility to what each role is doing within the team. So from this graphical representation, you can see on the left-hand side, our organization originally, we had our development team working in Visual Studio, our team foundation. And for us, the development team was working in this area as well as our product specialists team was working in this area. While separately across the wall, our quality testing team, our quality assurance software testing team was using HP Quality Center. And very little integration was happening between the two. And nor could the team see or have visibility of what was happening inside of Quality Center without us going through the extra work of providing reports. Also, it provided inadequate status tracking and reporting. So it's very hard to, in real time, keep track of the statuses of how test cases were linked um, and bugs tracked against the work that was actually being performed. Additionally, we knew that we needed to do automation, but this automation implementation for us was required to have resources that would deem to be necessary that can help support removing this wall or this division, that they had processes that would they would be able to give us insight on how to remove this wall while still allowing these teams to have a handshake and workflow. And it was very important that this testing team that had automation would have the talent that we needed to deliver for us this continuous delivery and integration model. 
And with that, we selected Logic Year as the resource choice for us. So our vision for production enhancement and I want to start off by saying that um, in order for any organization to start off with an endeavor like this, I would employ you to really have a vision around quality. So none of these things that we did were from the bottom up. It was actually a vision from the top up. We were given a challenge by our uh, senior manager who challenged us with having a quality vision where there was a single tool. So we wanted to create a fully integrated development and testing environment that was inside of Visual Studio. And the reason why we chose Visual Studio, our team foundation server, was because we were already using it. So it was the logical choice for us. It would allow us to be able to take advantage of MTM, which was also being deployed at that time. And it would allow the testers to be able to, to, to select specific test suites and configure those suites based on platforms that they were developing on or, in, or executing their test cases on. Testers could then reduce the test case design time. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, we talked about low reliability and low scalability of tests. So previously, our testers would design test cases that were what I would consider the old way of designing tests where you would blow out all of the detailed tests. And for us, those tests became very lengthy and a lot of work in maintaining them. It also required a lot of effort in designing tests, which impacted the velocity of the testing team to do test case design. So we wanted to reduce that. In addition to that, we wanted the entire Scrum team to have visibility to what the testing team was working on. And we wanted to eliminate the duplication of testing and missing tests. And by using Microsoft Test Manager, who has a share step feature, our testing organization is able to reuse tests from other teams and even other platforms within our organization. So two of our flagship products are able to share tests by just understanding the requirements that are being executed on both team sides. And then lastly, out of the box, we're able to take advantage of using TFS dashboard reporting metric capabilities, which became very challenging in doing the integration points when you're using a separate tool. Once we realize that we can get all of that by moving from Quality Center to selecting Microsoft Test Manager, we were able to eliminate the use of Quality Center for us, which for you may be an existing legacy testing platform. This is a huge cost savings for our organization because we are not having to maintain two separate um, platforms. We're all in one single platform. It's also a cost savings in reference to work because it saves the testing team time in being able to increase their ability to test case design. It reduces the number of redundancy and duplication across the teams. And also, it has improved the ability to maintain tests much easier. So while doing this, I mentioned earlier that we knew that automation was the key, but it wasn't the only solution. But we didn't know that it was the key in order for us to be able to deliver continuously. And as we gone through the process of identifying what were the key needs that we had for production enhancement and selecting an automation tool, we identified the need for us was that we had robust automation that could keep the pace with our development sprints. And we knew that whatever solution was selected, that solution needed to integrate with our manual testing solution of Microsoft Test Manager and TFS. We also knew that that solution needed to be able to support our interior architecture environment, which we had in place, and have the ability to do listening and waiting capabilities while those environments talked to one another. We also knew that if we wanted to improve the capabilities of our manual testing team, of keeping up with the development team, we needed to move from the old way of designing tests to more of an action-based testing method, or also known as keyword-driven tests. And finally, whatever tool we selected, or even vendor, if that was the route we would take, that vendor would need to support integration, 
of all of our tools, and they needed to be able to integrate with MTM that would allow our manual testers to stay in their tool of choice and never have to use their tool. Initial automation, so they needed to be able to automate it, automate it out of the box without having to do much customization for us. Also, that vendor would have to provide training to our team on how to go about actually doing action-based testing and designing tests and also working with development teams to develop testable code and automatable code. And then customization. And so many of you who may have worked with maybe some other vendors or even out-of-the-box solutions today realize that some things may not work right out of the box. And so where you may need rapid support from that vendor, we knew that customization was going to be required. So these were the things that we looked at when selecting the automation technology. So for us, the things that were involved was first and foremost building up an automation team. And for PE, we did that by nominating two uh, team members to act as the lead or project managers for our initial effort. And for those of you who may be wondering, this effort started back in 2012. And myself and another person were nominated to kind of oversee this effort. We identified a subset of 3,000 test cases for automation. And from that subset, we started working on training the testing team on test design. So the first thing was focusing on the inputs before we even talk about the automation, which is the output. We really needed to go back and look at our testing team and understand where we may have gaps in competencies, or not even in competencies, but in areas where we could improve. And improving in the, in the area of test case design was one area that we knew we needed to improve upon. Additionally, when you're working in an agile framework, that's completely different for testers who are used to working in a very waterfall methodology. And so training the testers on how to quickly think through test design when working in an agile framework versus in a waterfall framework. Training the testers on how to go about rethinking their, their old way of designing tests to action-based and keyword-driven tests. And also training the testers on identifying candidates for automation. So once we went through that, we started designing and creating the automated test in parallel. The manual testers started designing and redesigning the manual test. And in parallel, our automation testing team was starting to automate those tests. And then we started to define a workflow between the tools and the teams. And then we created auto-deploying test execution. So now let's talk about continuous integration and deployment. None of this is possible without auto deployment of tests, auto execution of those tests, and an automatic uh, population of the test results. So we can do all of the things above, but if we don't have a way to seamlessly auto deploy environments, auto deploy the test case execution and the statuses around those, it makes it almost are nearly impossible to do continuous integration and deployment. So that's not achievable without automation being there. In order to achieve that, you need that to be done automatically. And then lastly, the milestone that we needed to cover in order for our testers to stay in their tool of choice, which for us was Microsoft Test Manager, automation needed to be uh, the manual test team needed to be able to move from Quality Center to MTM. So let me spend some time talking to people that may be on the phone that may be wondering about the challenges that we face from moving from Quality Center to MTM. For years, our organization worked in Quality Center, so there were a lot of test cases that existed there, even on legacy applications. And so the challenge that we faced in our organization was, A, do we use a tool that could take the test cases from Quality Center and automatically just push them over to MTM. That's A. Do we take the option of B, which is soliciting a vendor and rewriting the tool specifically for us that has custom features that we had implemented and take the test cases out of Quality Center and MTM? Or do we see 
manually move the test cases from QC to MTM, but still leave them in the state that they were in, or I would say option D, which is take advantage of migrating from QC to MTM by redesigning the test as we move from one tool to another. So our organization chose to invest in option D, which is redesign the test as we move from Quality Center to MTM without using a tool to automatically push the data over. So what was done? Um, first we started with auditing a, a set of tests, and we'll call this the Pareto rule where we pick 600 tests. Most of the tests that we selected was known as our bill verification test, and we picked two platforms that we did this on. We picked this on what we call the simple platform, where it was mainly just client only, and then we did the BBT on a complex platform where it had to go through all tiers of our architecture and do the listening and the responding before test could move on to its next step. We believe that with this 20% from our bill verification test, it would actually give us the foundation for the other 80% that our automated regression test would be written on. And so by doing this, we selected those tests as the primary test to start off with. We also knew that if we were going to be successful in this endeavor, we needed to do the proof that our existing BVT could be replaced by doing this automat automated um, action-based uh, testing methodology. While in parallel of us doing this, we trained our testing team globally. So for us, we have a testing organization that is not only located here in the U.S., but we also have a testing organization at Halliburton's uh, Technology Center in Pune. So while we were working on this effort, we needed to train our team globally on how to do efficient test case design and action-based testing before we rolled out a plan to move the test from Quality Center to MTM. And then, as a part of execution, we knew that for us at Halliburton, we really wanted to focus on what our niche was, what our domain expertise was, which is in production enhancement and the testing around that. And we realized that it was in our best interest to outsource the niche around automation engineering. And based on Logic Gear's success that they had with Halliburton previously, we selected Logic Gear as our vendor to help with this effort. As a part of that, we work with Logic Gear in identifying resources for our team. So we were a part of the uh, interviewing process for the team. We work with Logic Gear in migrating the test cases from Quality Center to MTM. And there were points on some of the teams where the team members were not able to do that while they were doing this within their sprints. So Logic Gear graciously worked with us by providing the service of moving the test cases from Quality Center to MTM. Now I must say that this was never done blindly because in our, in our environment, all work that's done is always certified. So even by employing their services to help us migrate the, quality, the test from Quality Center to MTM, that still required an investment on our part to ensure that this was being done at a level of quality that we were expecting and that the engineers at Logic Gear actually understood the essence and the test objectives that were trying to be achieved. In parallel, Logic Gear engineers worked with our configuration management team to configure our virtual machines. So all virtual machines are hosted here in the U.S. The license server is hosted here in the U.S. And then we worked with the Logic Gear engineers to create the automation. And I want to say we worked with them because this is a very tightly coupled handshake process that we've identified. So our manual testing team here will always own what we consider the required test cases or the requirements, also known as high-level actions. They will design those uh, requirements or those high-level actions or high-level test cases in MTM. And once they finish the design of that, they will change the status to an appropriate status to let the engineers know whether or not that particular case is for automation. Once that flag is set, 
the logic your team then goes off and starts to work on a sprint and identifying the team and the resources required to accomplish this. I will tell you that in order to achieve working on getting all of the old tests out of Quality Center, never having a backlog of test cases already being automated, we had to take a two-pronged approach. Therefore, we've had a split team. We have a team that works on clearing the backlog from taking test cases that had not been automated and getting them automated, thus always keeping our Pareto principle there. And in parallel, there's always a team that's assigned to work on the work in parallel with the team that's working within the sprint. At some point, the team should arrive in the agile phase of hardening where they're still able to deliver all of the necessary features to accomplish being able to finish all testing within a five-hour window instead of eight weeks. Next slide. So let's talk about this fully integrated model that I mentioned on the previous slide. From end to end, this is a very tightly coupled um, workflow that we work to design, build, and execute to accomplish continuous integration and deployment. And this workflow supports application lifecycle model where you're able to work with all platforms in one environment. So for us, we can, within TFS, you can see the user stories being created. You can see the project status being tracked. You can see the tasks being created against those user stories. And you can see the development code that's being checked against those tasks. All bugs are linked to that environment. And then as you move across and you move into the next platform, which is MTM, all the tests are created our test requirements are created in MTM. And those test requirements are linked to the, te to the actual user stories in TFS. So the entire Scrum team has visibility to the test cases that are being created. In addition to that, certain tests are then selected based on requirements for test execution. And so the test plans are then created within the organization for test execution. And as you can see, this is a very small graphical representation of the virtual machines that we have. We have virtual machines that are deployed, and we are able to achieve running all automation in a five-hour or less time frame. And the way we were able to do that was through redesigning all of our tests and making sure that no test has a dependency on another test. And then finally, as you move over, all of the automation in this box or this platform to support the ability to perform test execution manually automated, this platform is integrated within MTM and TFS. And so the test cases are created and placed in the repository. The tests are associated with the requirements in MTM. So there's a linking that happens between the manual tests and the automated tests and then the tests are maintained there. So this is a fully integrated platform, and it still allows, as you can see in the middle, the manual testers to work from their tool of choice while still creating full team collaboration and no longer having that division of that wall there between the teams. Next slide. So the results, as I stated, our suites are running a five-hour period, reducing our uh, test execution for those suites to 99%. Instead of it taking uh, three hours to do verification, it takes less than 10 minutes. And more testing and deployment now follows development by maybe two sprints and others by one. And the only reason why these times may happen may be because the test lead is reshuffling the work that's coming into the team, and so they may ask the team to shift their prioritization. But this team really focuses, and when I say sprints, I'm talking about the backlog, not the actual sprint work itself. So that's how closely we're getting to getting the backlog cleared out. The next slide. So key takeaways for those that are on the webinar. It's my hope, as I stated at the beginning, that um, you're able to see clearly on the things that you may need to do 
to accomplish continuously integrating and deploying in your environment through your software testing organization. Also, um, this took a lot of buy-in from our entire team. Um, for me, I happen to have the advantage of being the manager of both the manual team and the automation team. So as we set to identify roles and responsibilities amongst those teams and selecting tools, there was a little bit of an advantage there. Um, but we did work with our uh, build definition team, our configuration management team, as we started to work on this effort. And then selecting technology very carefully is key. So we started with selecting technology not just on um, what others were doing, but it was more so on what was our vision for our organization to keep up with the rapid pace of our customers to maintain the velocity of our development team while maintaining quality as well as allowing our manual testers to stay in the tool of choice. So we started with a list of requirements first, and then we vetted those requirements with tools. Thus, we were able to land with Logic Gear being the tool of choice and the company of choice for us. And then lastly, it's very important that you can have tools all day, but if you don't do the investment of training your organization or tools and methods, I think you'll lose the opportunity to gain momentum there. And so, um, as you heard earlier, we, we selected a vendor that would also help us with training our organization, not just on um, the test case design, but moving from Quality Center to MTM, we still were challenged with some of the feature functionalities with using MTM. So Logic Gear, um, who had already worked previously with Microsoft to actually develop the integration point between its tool, Test Architect, and MTM, were able to help mentor and coach my staff on actually how to use MTM. And for us who are challenged with trying to um, look at Quality Center, who may be using Quality Center today, and MTM and trying to make those match. I will caution you in doing that because it really is not a match between the two. And so that's why having a company or a vendor that will help you with transitioning from one tool to another is very helpful. And then the key takeaways is once we had the tools in place and the people in place, we still needed to define a workflow um, for using those tools. And in testing organization, having a software testing workflow is very important. And so defining a workflow between all the tools that I mentioned, between TFS, and MTM, and TA was very important. But also defining a workflow and the handshake between the roles was equally important. And so making sure that if you take on an endeavor like this, um, you also spend the time with thinking about the processes and how teams will talk and integrate with each other in the tools. And then lastly, accepting the fact that doing something this large, as I stated before, although quite challenging is rewarding, requires a significant change in your organization. And those changes, as stated, may require you to train your testing team on how to think differently on how to approach testing. It may require a change in how to train your development organization on thinking about creating uh, testable code and automatable code. Um, it may train your um, automation team on getting in the game with your scrum team and being a member of the team and not just a team where you're throwing work across the wall to them and waiting for it to come back. So in our implementation, it's a very implementation, it's a very integrated, tightly coupled um, implementation. So with that, I'll turn the presentation back over to Joe. All right. Thank you very much, Sharonda. Um, what I'll do now is just go through a little bit about uh, our company and what we do and what we provide and how we helped in this transition. Um, so in case you don't know, uh, we are Logic Gear and we are 
provide both software testing technology and the expertise, as Sharonda mentioned. We have our test architect, test automation tool, and then we support that with test architect professional services. Um, like Sharonda said, especially as you get into more complicated scenarios where you're moving to uh, deeper into agile and going to continuous integration and continuous delivery, it, it takes more than just a tool. It's going to take expertise to go along with it. And we've put together a team of professionals that are able to provide that for our clients as well. The testing challenges, as Sharonda mentioned, in going to continuous delivery environments are really many. And what we've typically seen is it's the speed of test creation is too slow. And that's going to be especially evident if you're doing manual testing. Test maintenance is always a significant effort. And depending on which method you're using, test reuse can be very can be limited, which further slows down your speed of testing. And then as you get into these complicated environments where you're doing a lot of deployments, your test cases library becomes very large and test management becomes difficult. So we've worked on processes to make that improve um, that as much as can be done. The, the, the typical automation approach is really a bottom-up test design approach. The goal for everybody is, is to start automating right away and automate as many tests as they can. Um, and that's what most tools are designed to do and that's, that's been how most people approach it. The, the issues with that is it's really a, a bottom-up logic. The business logic is mixed in with the UI flow which is your system level logic. So you've got these two types of logic going on in your test cases and your test scripts become very long. Then when you go back to maintain these, your automation ratio becomes a one-to-one, -one, which really significantly impacts your automation and your ability to scale. So being in the testing business a long time, you know, we were also running up against that with our own testing and we looked at it and we came up with uh, the action-based testing technology as really what we were going to do to improve our processes. And that was a test method that was developed by Hans Bowalda back in 2001. Uh, it's, it's an advanced keyword test method. And what it does is it really separates your, your test design from your test automation. And it focuses on the principle of design test first and then automate. And the, resulting process makes the test long-term maintainable. And what, what this chart shows is from the previous chart, uh, it, it shows what happens whenever you go with your, your typical test automation where you're starting from the bottom up and you're automating tests and, and mixing in business flows and UI flows. Uh, you reach that limit of maintainability. Whenever you use action-based testing, uh, you're going to start out a little bit slower because you're, you're designing your tests first. You're designing them very logically and critically, and then you automate those in what we call actions. Um, and what that does is it's a little bit slower to get started because you're, you're designing your automation. But once you get started, your automation becomes a lot faster, and it becomes easier to automate. And this is what we say. It lets you get to automation critical mass. And, and that's the point where you can achieve and sustain a positive return from your test automation investment. And what makes that possible is, is that the, the number of, of your automation programs, in this case actions, is much less than the number of tests automated so that you're much more efficient and effective in what you're doing along test design. So our, our strategy was we developed a method first and then we developed the automation tool that really supports that method. Now most automation tools today you go out and they all have the, the core automation technology. Our approach, we started with it, was we wanted to build a, a fully integrated test automation platform. And that includes the action-based testing component, as well as a test lifecycle management component. So you have, in addition to your automation technology, you have everything to design the test up front, automate it, and that automation is very customizable so that you can go into not only your standard applications of desktop and mobile, but you've got custom applications that can be customized to automate just about any platform that you need. And then it also has the test lifecycle management component where you're within Test Architect you can manage the test cases, but it also provides that extensibility and linking into ALM platforms like Microsoft 
um, Visual Studio, TFS, and MTM, uh, Jenkins, and other ones that allow you to, uh, I'm sorry, Zephyr, that allow you to have the full ALM capability for your testing management, which is going to work with your rapid development cycles. The, the, the real key here is, is we have a tool plus a method, and what lets you get to critical mass is that instead of automating thousands of test scripts, uh, you're able to automate a few hundred actions, uh, and the reason you can do that is that there's, there's fewer, there's a limited number of actions within an application that you're going to be actually using to test the system level applications. Now you can create as many business level applications as you want in variations, but there's a limited number of, of functional system level actions that you're going to be required for any application. And by creating a few of these, you can maintain, you can create and easily maintain thousands of tests. And then on the organizational side, the test module organization that Test Architect provides uh, really simplifies your management throughout the testing life cycle so you can really keep track of your tests, organize them logically, and wherever you do have to make maintenance, you can find them very easily. They're all segregated and kept separate. Um, so that is really the foundation for getting there and, uh, you know, was, was really instrumental in making Halliburton's transformation very successful. As Sharonda mentioned, there's a lot more to it than just a tool, and we were able to also come in and help them in a number of areas. Um, expert assistance can really help you jumpstart your test automation. Uh, we provide automation consulting uh, that can help you identify what to automate. A lot of teams struggle, especially going from manual tests into automation where they've never automated before is really where do you start. Um, as Sharonda said, they they looked at their overall testing. It's like, where, where do you start this? So it was a very uh, strategic process where they analyzed the test cases and identified the subset of the ones where automation would give them the biggest bang for the buck, speed up their processes, and then let their manual testers continue to do the exploratory testing that they needed. Um, we also gave coach are able to give coaching and training on effective test design um, and then help ramp up on automation tools so you get real proficient in those areas. And then we provide the engineering services that provides customization to any platform you need, such as ALM integration. And then as, as Sharonda said, um, we provide the outsourcing to where whatever is not core to your business, Outsourcing is a great way to handle that. That will save you on resources. It will be uh, very flexible. You can ramp up or ramp down as much as you need. It's a great way to get started. Uh, what we were able to do for Sharon and what we've been able to do for a number of clients was actually come in and start their initial amount of automation uh, with several hundred test cases so that they're able to start ramp up their automation very quickly and then take over the management and maintenance from there on. So it's uh, a very good way to do it whenever you're starting test automation from scratch or switching over to uh, another tool from your current test automation in case you've got platforms that, that weren't lining up like, like they need to do at Halliburton. So the key takeaways from our part and dovetails with what Sharonda said that automation tools are essential, but they're part of the solution and won't be the entire solution. And any time that you start testing, I think it'll, uh, you go back and you look at anything you're doing, test design is going to be critical to long-term automation success. Um, without the proper test design, uh, automating a bad test is only going to make bad tests run faster. Um, so the, the key here is, is your test design. And if you do this right, it's possible to get to that level of automation critical mass to where you're getting a big ROI on your test automation investment. And uh, as a partner, we can provide both the technology and expertise to get you there very, very quickly. So with that, I think now we'll go into a uh, few questions and answers. So let's, uh, let's see what we what we have here. Um, first one is for Sharonda. Sharonda, what, what was the, the most difficult part with your team in changing test methods? Um, 
changing test methods. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the most difficult part for my team of, for changing test methods was changing test methods. Um, <laughs> the most difficult part was uh, getting the team to accept change. Um, once, once they first had to ex accept the fact that we were changing and we were not going to write test cases the way that we used to write them, they were more open to um, let's see what was going to be different. I think that I showing the team that they didn't have to spend time writing a detailed test, like clicking, if, let's say for instance you want to launch um, Microsoft Word and they didn't have to spend the time clicking on, um, writing down the detailed steps of click on start and then go to programs and then go to Microsoft. Office and then Word, and all they did, all they have to do now is just say launch Office. They found that to be very great um, because that was less work on them, less maintenance on them, and it also allowed them to parameterize that particular test. And so they realized, oh, now I can start to take advantage of just say launch the application, and now between two applications that are in our portfolio, all they're doing is providing the parameter on which application you want to launch. So uh, making the test more scalable. And then lastly, the method as well, and I wouldn't even say it was method, but designing. Um, when we started this effort and we started to train the team on doing it, it was funny because the team members were arguing amongst themselves. They were on the same team. They had been executing the same test the way they had had been executing them for a couple of years because I picked one team to do it first. And that team couldn't even agree on what the test objectives were. So even they weren't even clear on, okay, now exactly what were we doing with this test? And so getting the team to be very clear about test objectives was very important at the beginning. And they saw a great, what once they saw that they weren't clear with the old way that they were designing tests, that they couldn't tell that when they got the keys to the car, if they were supposed to just use the keys to test whether it opened the door or not, or use the keys to get in the car and go to the stoplight and then come back. Once they started to understand that method, and through coaching, um, they loved it. So I think the struggle was first just getting them to understand that we were changing. But I think the adaptability has been great. And we've actually um, changed not just this small team. This team is very large. It's a very large testing organization that's here and in Pune Technology. And the change was quick um, but easily adaptable by the team. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Um, has your automation found issues in the regression runs? Um, you know, I, I, hopefully that would be yes, but um, <laughs> did, did it help you there? <laughs> Absolutely. All day, every day. Um, and I don't know if the word would be issues. I would say that the purpose of uh, automation is to quickly tell us um, the impacts of change, if there are any. That's really the purpose of automation, is to let us know the impacts of change, if there are any. Um, and so from one bill to another, um, we're able to say, you know what, the code that's been cha checked in, there's no impact and everything is green. And then the code that's been checked in, there is an impact. That impact doesn't always mean that it's a bug. It may just mean that um, the development team may have uh, forgotten to let the automation team be aware that this change was coming. But Absolutely, um, all day, every day, um, the automation is constantly telling us something. Okay, and uh, we got just time for one more question. So we have uh, uh, one question I really like is, uh, what kind of voodoo did you use to convince management to invest in training for teams? <laughs> <laughs> is that question for me? Um, okay, so uh, first of all, let me be honest here, and, and I want to be transparent. Um, we do have the advantage in our organization that the person that's in charge of our organization uh, has a quality background. And so remember I talked about the vision was all around quality. And so that was advantageous for us. Um, second of all, um, in our organization structure, we happen to also have management that believes in continuous education, whether it's uh, 
you know, going back to school or whether it's on training of tools. So I think once we made a decision that we were going to switch tools, right, and I started doing the research and working with our partner, Logic Gear, on the training of that um, and, and making the proposals around why, um, and giving the business case, because I still have to give the business case and the dollars amount it, around it and what the long-term benefits would be for our organization, I think it was an easy yes um, for our management staff. So I think you have to begin to know what your vision is and how the training will help you support that vision and being able to write a business case around it. All right. Thank you, Sharonda. Well, we are right up against uh, our deadline. And uh, for any questions we didn't get answered, we uh, do have those captured, and we'll be answering those directly in email to you. Uh, we thank everyone for your time today, and we do hope this was very informal informational to you and uh, we will be uh, we have recorded this and we'll be sending out a link to the recording that you'll be receiving from us uh, probably in a, in a day or so as soon as uh, the recording is all done uh, we'll get that out to you so thank you everyone and thank you Sharonda you're welcome bye-bye